Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, today I would like to share some of the work that uh, we have been doing at Indiana. Uh, understanding the dynamics and emergent complexity in nanoparticle superstructures. And before I, uh, first of all, I would like to use a, one quick slide to provide an overview of what my group does. We are a relatively young group. I started there in 2017. Right now we have <clears throat> three areas of focus research. Number one is on metal alloy and nanocrystals. We are primarily interested in non-noble metal-based nanocrystals such as copper and nickel for catalytic applications. Second area of research is on nanocrystal assemblies. We are primarily interested in the phase behavior kinetic pathways of polymer grafted nanocrystals. And third area is using in situ electron microscopy to understand the chemical transformations such as nucleation growth and dissolution at a single particle level as well as self-assembly and reconfiguration of the nanoparticle superlattices. And today I'm going to share some work that we've done recently on nanoparticle assemblies as well as in situ electron microscopy. Okay. So uh, I guess I don't have to motivate too much about the structure diversity and the nanoparticle assemblies. And the primary question we, my group are trying to address is in addition to what superstructure can be made for given uh, um, building blocks, and we are more interested in how and why those superstructures form. Okay? And to answer that question, one way is to do experiment, and especially being able to probe the, probe the self-assembly process using in situ techniques. And we also collaborate with uh, uh, theories and computation groups and in this case, I highlight one of the pioneer work from Sharon's group uh, about a decade ago, where they show this uh, diversity of superstructures by form, uh, formed by distinct shaped nanocrystals. And I hope I'll convince you later that when you start adding interaction to these hard particles, then the structure diversity and complexity can increase significantly for any given shape. So self-assembly of nanoparticle is essentially a crystallization process. And to describe crystallization, there's classical crystallization, which is a highly simplified picture that assumes the nuclei share the same thermodynamic properties and structure as the final bulk crystals. And in nanoparticle assemblies, more often, uh, they follow this so-called non-classical crystallization pathways where the intermediates can be quite complex. It can be amorphous particles or small crystallites that further attach orientated, orientedly or not orientedly into larger scale objects. In a lot of um, example, as uh, for example, uh, um, as Alex uh, mentioned earlier uh, during his talk this morning, is that even if you know the pairwise interaction okay, of the system, it's often very hard to predict the final structure, not to mention the actual crystallization pathway. Okay. To study this uh, <coughs> crystallization pathway, there are a lot of techniques. For example, small angle X-ray scattering is one of them. This technique provides very good time resolution, but a, it's an ensemble average technique that obscures microscopic details, okay, and which are often important for gaining mechanistic insight. Optical microscopy has been utilized in the uh, micron-sized colloid community to examine the crystallization behavior, but this technique fails because of the limited spatial resolution when it comes to nanoparticles. So the technique we are going to use is the so-called liquid cell TEM, and, and there are two versions of it, uh, as Chen has mentioned. Uh, number one is the silicon nitrile-based platform. It's a, it has been commercialized, and, and the second platform is the graphene liquid cell, where you take basically two sheets of graphene and stack together, trapping a small pool of liquid. This technique allows you to image um, a very thin object with much higher spatial resolution, but when it comes to nano nanoparticle assemblies, you typically want a larger size liquid pool. And therefore, that's the technique we are going to stick to in the rest of the talk. Okay? 
And this technique has been studied, uh, used to study nanoparticle growth, assembly, and dissolution. And um, before we started working in this uh, area, there has been a lot of great works. Um, for example, I highlight here uh, the beautiful work from Chen's group where they use electron beam illumination to trigger the self-organization of gold triangular plate. There are other group, uh, works, this is one from uh, Argon National Lab that shows the formation of uh, chain-like aggregates, and as well as uh, chain formation of uh, castellanite octopod. So the question we ask uh, is the following. Uh, um, in a lot of these earlier examples, the, uh, so the uh, solution is primarily aqueous phase. We're interested in in potentially expanding this technique to non-aqueous solution, where the hope is the choice of solvent conditions can provide additional uh, control uh, for the assembly conditions, okay? And in a lot of these uh, uh, examples, uh, especially much earlier examples, the particles tend to interact very strongly with the membrane. So that tend to lower the um, nanoparticle diffusivity quite significantly. Okay. One of the bigger picture questions we ask is that can we decouple the TEM imaging conditions such as magnification dose rate from the actual uh, self-assembly condition? For example, at a given dose rate, can, can we control another parameter, say solvent condition, to control the self-assembly behavior? So we started from a very simple system and there's uh, namely polystyrene grafted gold nanoparticles. These particles are, uh, the, the initial example we examined are spheres as well as octahedra. They are coated with thiolated poly polystyrene that are relatively short, about three kilodalton okay, molecular weight. Okay, this work was led my, uh, primarily by my graduate student, Ya Xu, who recently graduated. And here I showed six independent experiments using the exact same particle, okay? Polystyrene coated gold spheres. The only difference is the electron beam dose rate. As you can see, at the very lo low dose rate, the particle barely moves. At a very high dose rate, the particle quickly dissolve uh, from the silicon nitride membrane and then later departed from the imaging area. Uh, with uh, intermediate dose rate, say about 10 electron per angstrom square per second, the particles move fairly rapidly, but they stay in the field of view for extended period of time. Again, all these six experiments were done in, in a relatively high boiling point solvent, or octane. And we can track the particles motion and at different dose rate and plot the trajectories. From there, we can further plot the mean square displacement. And from the time dependence that we can extract the um, uh, diff diffusion constant of particles. And as shown in this inset, as the electron dose rate increases, we saw a monotonic increase in the particle diffusion constant. This suggests that the mo particle motion is actually activated by the electron beam illumination. So um, the next exact experiment we did is the following. So <clears throat> we fixed the electron beam dose rate to be around 10 electron percent per angstrom square percent per second. And as shown in this set of movies, in octane upon electron beam illumination, the particles started moving and they remain mobile, but they never come close to each other. On the contrary, we also use a very polar solvent, in this case, butanol, and the same particle behave quite differently. Okay? They quickly aggregate into this disordered agglomerate. This experiment suggests that <clears throat> in octane, the particles are relatively repulsive. They are long range repulsive because they never come very close to each other, but the interactions switch to very strongly attractive in butanol. Our interpretation is the following. In this case, there's Van der Waals attraction between the particle, and there's also electrostatic repulsion between them. You may ask, where does the electrostatic, re electrostatic repulsion come from? 
It come from the fact that when you illuminate the samples by electron beam, it tend to cause charging to both the membrane as well as the particles, okay? And recommend that we hypothesize that if we use a more intermediate polarity solvent by say mixing uh, octane and butanol, say one-to-one -one volume mixture, we should be able to uh, reduce the attraction between the particle and therefore favor crystallization as opposed to agglomeration in comparison to the butanol case. And that's exactly what we saw here. Okay. Now, before I go into the details of the assembly process, I want to point out first that the same exact particle when they assemble in situ and ex situ, they are very different. In this case, when you dry this, the particle onto a um, TEM grid ex situ, okay, they form this close packed arrays where the surface to surface near neighbor distance is on the order of three nanometer. The same particle, when they assemble this hexagonal lattice and the in situ liquid salt TM conditions, their surface to surface distance is much, much larger. From the pair distribution analysis, their surface distance is about 25 nanometer. So, and this is important because it tells us that under this liquid salt TM conditions, the interactions between the particles are much longer range and the ligand, ligand interdi interdigitation is negligible, okay? And with this one-to-one uh, -one mixture of octane and butanol, we can also maintain this high diffusivity, <clears throat> which is about 3,000 nanometer square per second. So to put this number in the, into context, it is still three orders magnitude lower than what you expect from what you predict from Stokes-Einstein equation, but it's among the highest diffusivity reported under liquid cell TEM conditions. So uh, to analyze the assembly trajectory and pass phase, one technical challenge we have to overcome initially is accurate se segmentation of the particles from individual movie frames. It, it turned out that it's impossible to use a single threshold bait based image segmentation to accurately detect all the particles from any given movie frame. The difficulty arises the following. If you look at this schematic, because this is a um, hermetic seal cell, there are particles assembling near each of the two silicon nitride membrane. So you see the particles that are in focus as well as out of focus. So the oxygen focus particle contribute to the contrast. To solve this problem, we use deep learning based uh, approach. Um, so here we develop a workflow where the first so-called UNET model was trained by computer created, computer generated faked TEM images. And then you can see the segmentation outcome is okay, but not satisfactory. By that, I mean, some of the particles are not well segmented. To solve this challenge, we manually correct several images to make sure all the particles are well detected and then use data augmentation to create 600 image pair, 1200, basically 1200 images. And that large data set was used to train a second UNET model and which leads to uh, satisfactory uh, segmentation outcome. By that, I mean each of the particle, their centroid and, co and, and contours were accurately segmented from uh, every single movie, uh, movie frames. With those information, we can perform a lot of quantitative analysis. For example, six, we can plot six-fold um, bound orientational parameters and, and, and uh, local density, which is basically the inverse of the Werner cell area, among other uh, local um, parameters. So here's the assembly trajectories, the raw data and superimposed six-fold bound orientational prop, uh, parameter. And you can see that um, as the assembly takes place, there's first a very rapid increase in the density and not the long-range uh, 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 translational order. Here at the bottom I show we define two 
global order parameters, this precise six, capital precise six and precise six prime, these are both ensemble averaged local six fold bond orientational parameter order, uh, order parameter. Their only difference is that the ensemble average here is taken prior to taking the absolute value. So in this case, it preserved the phase correlation among local uh, six fold bond uh, orientational order parameters. And there, It's a second layer. It's a second layer. It's the other layer, exactly. It's moving independently almost. It, it, it is independent. Ah, it's there are two sheets of. The other window. Exactly. Ah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why, why does it arbitrarily move to the other side? Yeah, exactly. And no problem. And here I show the key frames along the assembly pathways, and we. Uh, um, uh, I that we are able to identify four key stages, namely gas-like state, cluster state, uh, polycrystalline solid state, and single crystalline solid state. And these four stages are characterized by the combination of local density and local six-fold bond orientation order parameter. For the gas state, both other parameters are very low. And for the cluster state, both parameters are broadly distributed. And for the polycrystalline solid state, there's a narrowly distributed and yet high density, but very low, still very broadly distributed uh, six-fold bond orientational parameter. And when it reaches the single crystalline state, both parameters are high and narrowly distributed. And this imaging workflow turned out to be quite general. So here is the same solvent, one-to-one -one mixture of octane and butanol. And, but uh, in this case, we also look at polystyrene graphic gold octahedra. They assemble into this so-called two-dimensional hexagonal rotator phase where the orientational correlation between the neighboring particles is very, very low. Now that we have identified the four crystallization uh, stages, we can examine the microscopic detail of how the system moves from one stage to the next. Here I show additional snapshot from the initial gas-like state to the cluster state. One important observation is that there's no chain-like formation. Instead, there's only local uh, formation of local hexagonal-like uh, island. They, uh, some, over time, they, they, the small hexagonal island can fluctuate between crystal-like and liquid-like state, and they exchange monomers to grow into larger um, island. And the key here is that this, this tells us that interaction is moderately attractive, but not very strongly attractive, because otherwise you expect the, um, the standard-like uh, formation, like reminiscent of diffusion-limited aggregation behavior. We have also examined the, um, how, uh, how the system moved from polycrystalline solid to single crystalline solid. Apparently, the system has to eliminate green boundaries. As shown here, the snapshot at 24.2 seconds specifically, uh, uh, the system features both a high angle as well as low angle green boundary, okay? But that high angle green boundary, which is the green boundary between the pink and the green domain got it eliminated first. So this, we interpreted this result as uh, due to um, the higher interfacial energy between more, uh, 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 more uh, misoriented grains. We also look at the um, kinetics of green growth. Here we use, we plot the six-fold orientational correlation function, and if we set this value to be 0.5, we can extract a characteristic uh, grain size, and this is time-dependent exponent turn out to be 0.33, which is less than 0.5. This tells us the green growth fo follow the so-called abnormal green growth behavior. Okay. And one of the manifestations of that abnormal green growth behavior is shown here, where if you look at the boundary of the growing super lattice, there's not only monomer attachment, but there's also, oops, there's also 
this uh, cluster attachment where, sorry, where uh, a group of particles will fly from the outside the field of view and attach the growing super lattice and be, uh, uh, become incorporated into the crystal. So the super lattice form under these conditions are quite dynamic, okay? As shown here, so as the system develops long range hexagonal order, there, the lattice actually expands slightly, okay? We, uh, we attribute this intuitive lattice expansion to, to be due to the fact that as we continuously illuminate the sample, they actually acquire slightly more and more charges over time. So that serves to weaken the net attraction between the particles. Um, apparently electrostatic charging be, uh, play an important role in the assembly behavior. And you may ask how many charges does each particle carry under these type of conditions? Uh, that turned out to be a very difficult question because these are hermetic CO cells and we cannot directly measure or probe the number of charges that particles uh, uh, um, have. But because we can observe the uh, crystallization behavior, we can do some quantitative analysis. Specifically what we did here is we know that in order for them to crystallize, there's two interaction forces. There's the Van der Waals attraction between the gold core. There's also electrostatic repulsion. And if you sum the two interactions based on uh, DM, DLVO theory, there should be a, um, in order for the crystallization to take place, there should be a small attraction well at longer distance followed by a uh, a shorter distance barrier that prevent the particle from irreversibly aggregating. However, there's no theory that tell us exactly what the magnitude of U1, this is the well, and the U2, this barrier needs to be in order to predict crystal formation. What we did then is to do a parameter space sweep where if we custom, if we define our own criteria of U1, U2, we examine what the combination of particle charge and the balance will satisfy that uh, criteria. And this analysis already uh, generates some interesting insight. As you can see, as we make the uh, cr cr criteria more and more uh, strict, there's a rapid narrowing of the allowable the balance but not the particle charge, suggesting that the divalence is a more a critical control variable. Okay, um, the dynamic of the dynamic uh, lattice allow us to visualize also the defect generation, migration, and uh, annihilation. Here I show example of vacancy creation and vacancy diffusion. Okay, and we also observe dislocation dynamics. So for a two-dimensional hexagonal lattice, dislocation, the core of dislocation consists of a pair of five coordinate and seven coordinate disclination side. Dislocation can glide along the burger vector's direction. They can also climb that involves vacancy partic participation. Two dislocations can also react with, with, each, with each other while preserving the vectorial sum of the Burgess vector. So quick summary of this part, I, uh, we introduced a model material system, namely polymer grafted gold nanoparticles for studying controlled self-assembly uh, 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 into highly ordered super lattices. And we sh showed that electron beam e irradiation actually activate nanoparticle motion under this type of imaging conditions. On the other hand, the solvent composition provide additional control that mediate nanoparticle interactions and control their assembly pathways. So since this uh, in initial work, we have expanded this uh, study to uh, non-spherical nanoparticles. Here I show three movies where they are all using the exact same polymer grafted nanocubes. The only difference is the solvent polarity going from left to right, low polarity to high 
polarity. And the key here is that as we make the interparticle attraction stronger, we can control the phase behavior from this hexagonal rotator phase to a more square-like phase. Okay? And we can also analyze the trajectories of the um, orientational order parameter versus positional order parameter. The, the key take-home message here is that for the hexagonal rotator phase, the um, uh, a hexagonal order develops largely independent from the orientational order. The particle remain orientationally disordered, okay? But in the other extreme, the uh, orientational order and positional order co-develop from the very beginning of the assembly process. Okay. There, there's this shadow that I was asking for now only for the low solar polarity, but not for the... Oops, sorry. Low polarity, okay. So Uh, I think, so uh, we have, we also have, this probably just a um, coincidence, and we do have other movies where even for this square-like formation, we see the other side, so. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Two minutes, okay. Well, I, I'll, keep, let me see, I'll keep it really short. Okay, um, I'll briefly introduce uh, another work that we did recently, which is con understanding the um, assembly behavior of colloidal tetrahedra. So um, um, tetrahedra is a very interesting shape because of its non-central symmetry, non symmetry as well as it doesn't tile space. And tetrahedra packing involves, uh, there's, there's competition between local ordering of tetrahedra versus global order, as shown in this image from um, Sharon's uh, uh, a group's paper, that a lot of these locally uh, preferred motifs of tetrahedra, um, they have five-fold symmetry, and therefore they are incompatible with the uh, long-range periodic uh, uh, ordering. So, um, uh, my, group, my, my student E took the um, challenge of synthesizing highly uniform te gold tetrahedra. We move away from a lot of earlier study which involves cadmium selenide tetrahedra because gold provides uh, much versatile surface chemistry and potentially a better co improved control of the tetrahedra tip sharpness. So I want to highlight one example before I wrap up, which is we look at not, not only three-dimensional assembly, but also two-dimensional assembly behavior of tetrahedra. These are essentially the exact same tetrahedral core. The only difference going from left to right is we are increasing the polymer ligand length gradually. And you see the, the rich diversity and complexity of the phases that produce. So for each column, these are T, SEM image and TEM image and corresponding structure model. And I want to focus your attention on the trend here. So going from one to three, there's um, the tetrahedral orientation remains the same. Okay, basically there, there's face up and tip up, but there's only la lateral distortion as you make the system softer. Starting from the hardest example, you get triangular packing symmetry in plane, and then you have centered rectangular and more into rectangular. And then as you make the system even softer, all of a sudden there's a switch in the local uh, orientation, preferred orientation of tetrahedra. In this case, half the tetrahedra become edge up instead of face up or tip up. As you make the system even more softer, all of them assume the edge up configuration, okay? So we attribute this change in the lattice symmetry to the change in the preferred contact mode between neighboring tetrahedra. And I guess I'll stop here and I would like to, uh, uh, I, I just want to say that I'm happy to talk more about this, uh, this uh, system. Yeah.
these are all two dimensions. There are two layers. We call it two dimensional because they are, they are relatively thick, thickness wise is very thin compared. They're on the surface. Yes. We control the, uh, so these samples are made by drop casting on ethylene glycol surface. The, the solution spread really well. And then we, if we control the concentration of particle in the spreading solution, we can get predominant this bilayer or two dimensional superstructures. We also have examples of three dimensional structure where you can increase the particle concentration. I guess I'll stop there and I'd like to thank the organizers and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Any questions? Conversations? Okay, so uh, Grant Rotskopf, Stanford. So um, in the hexagonal rotor and the other systems that you were looking at with different shapes, you get these kind of interesting surface modes um, and there seems to be some sort of symmetry breaking in you know the directionality in which the rotator spins. Do you, do you understand the origin of that? Like what, what could be causing that? Because the, the particles themselves are- So are you referring pure, to this case? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, all of them sort of have these sort of symmetry breaking surface modes, it appears, but I mean, not as dramatically as the rotator. But why why is the symmetry breaking? Is this something hydrodynamic from, uh, do you have any speculation about what's so causing that? If I understand your question correctly, okay, I think the, there's still some, the particles still feel each other slightly, even though they're distance now. So if you look at carefully some of the frames, there's, there's local orientational correlation between, but not long range. Very slight local on this, this, the orientational cubes are not completely random. So I'm asking in, in particular about the, the boundary layer particles, why they're moving in, you know, one direction. Uh, that part, I, I don't think we understand. We are okay. in the process <laughs> of understanding it, yes. Hey, uh, it was a great talk. Um, so I have a question on, on this and, and the previous one with, with, it sort of follows up on what uh, Tobias was talking about. Um, so these things are assembling at the top and the bottom of the windows. Yes. And I imagine there's just a big gap between them. They're not thick enough to actually span the full um, uh, window, correct? Yes. So uh, that, that introduces, I think, both a, a challenge and an opportunity here, which that to me implies that, yes, there's an attractive potential between the particles, but there's a stronger attractive potential to the surface as it's actually radiating. Otherwise, they would be assembling in three dimensions in solution. And so the opportunity there is if you can change the chemistry or something about what's actually at that silicon nitride window, you may be able to modify the diffusion across the surface. So the, the yes. question I have is, is that something you've thought about? Is it something that can be done? And is it something that, that ultimately could affect what you're actually seeing here? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually spent a lot of time thinking about it while we were doing this research. Um, so the reality is when you illuminate the sample, both the silicon nitrogen membrane and the particle become positive charged. That's a generally agreed upon scenario. So there's not only particle-particle attraction lateral wise, there's also particle membrane attraction or repulsion in the vertical direction. So by changing the solvent, by controlling the medium, you can actually control the electrostatic in, and, and you can control the overall attract interaction between the particle and the membrane. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess, I, I, my, I guess my question is, is there a way that you can put two design handles in, one so that you can tune one without tuning the other? So change how sticky the particles are to the surface without affecting the way they're uh, attached to each other. Uh, one way to do that is to say modify, pre-modify the silicon nitride membrane with some ligand that selectively attract or repel the polystyrene. So that's one idea, I think, although we haven't tried it. Okay. Yeah. If I could ask just a quick technical follow-up question. So, I mean, you're only showing a limited number of videos here, so this may just be 
you know, random. But it, it looks like in each of the cases, either you only see assembly at the top where you're focused, or you see assembly at the top and the bottom, but the bottom always seems to be a little bit smaller. Is that just because of the way uh, as the electrons pass through the window and through the solvent, the, they're, they're not charging the bottom membrane less? Possible. Uh, for the sphere system, actually we don't see that. Let's see. You typically see more or less similar size assemblies between the top and bottom membrane. But for the cubes, yes. Okay. Um, I think what you said so is, is that it random or is it actually repeatable? Um, I wouldn't, it's more re repeatable than random. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we are trying to understand that. Okay. I, it's not I have completely other random, but, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them later. but sometimes we do see um, similar area assembly between the top and bottom membrane. Yeah. Um, I get two questions. One is I'd, I'd say that if you want to separate interactions between particles and, and, and substrate, uh, look to DNA because you, you can dial it in the way you want and, and separate them completely and, and that, that's been proven and I think it would be really good for what you guys were just talking about. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what you've done, which I think are, are some of the most spectacular images of, of uh, this, these types of processes in situ that, I, that I've ever seen. Um, you step back and, 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 and think about what you said, that the, the beam, which I would expect, uh, affects uh, particle motion. Uh, question is, what do you actually learn about the real process? Um, and what have you learned about the real process? Can you say anything definitive that we get from these imaging capabilities that go beyond what we already know in terms of crystallization? And then coupled to that, how do you separate it from the other issue? That did, did I did I influence the whole experiment with the beam to the point that I changed pathway and it's irrelevant, or is it really a reflection of of what what's occurring in in, in a system not under a beam? Yeah, uh, I think that's a deep question that we we think a lot, and this is I would say the very initial work of that we present here. That's always the answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, we. <laughs> by the by, the way, this is the same question people ask of the single molecule spectroscopy. So that worked out well for them. So, so it still could work out well for you too. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but it, it, it's really you know it's the uncertainty principle, right? Uh, um, you, 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 you are, you are, you're making a measurement where there, there's significant perturbation on the things that you're trying to measure, yeah. and, 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 and how you separate. Uh, the beam effect from from what it's telling me about the real system, I think, is a is still a big challenge. Correct or not? Um, I would say the beam effect in this specific case is depositing charge, so cause charging of the particle. But the big picture we have is if you can understand the, and the interparticle interactions under this type of environment, and then being watched the whole assembly pathways, you can learn a lot of potentially micro microscopic details and mechanism. But the f first step is to, to make sure we understand the actual interactions. So to answer that question, um, we th I think we need to um, potentially co collaborate with simulation and computation people where, uh, folks, where if I should show, see this movie, can you actually extract the interaction potential from a small segment of the movie? And does that interaction change over time? Okay. So I think that's the first step where we truly know how two particles interact. Okay. And then once you have that understanding, then you can correlate with the observed assembly pathways. So right now we cannot, as I said, we do not know the exact interaction because we cannot measure the charge of the particle that it carries under this type of electron beam illumination conditions. So yeah, I, I acknowledge there's still a long way to go in this. But what I can say is these are not random movies. We, the experiments are quite reproducible. 
So that gave me some hope where we can really one day make this a programmable system where we can control between things and understand the, the mechanism and pathway. Oh, it's very impressive and exciting. Thanks. Yeah, beautiful talk, beautiful talk, Xinchen. So, um, I was going to ask you a question, but since the chat asked that question, I want to make a <laughs> comment. Um, I mean, make a comment as someone who has been working on Equifix TM imaging and solvent assemblies. So, Xinchen is doing great pioneering work for um, organic solvent or mediated nanoparticle solvent assembly. So, the situation is actually a lot more complicated. But when we're looking at Equity solution, nanoparticle self-assembly, basically all the questions you were asking, we got a solution already. Because in aqueous solution, people actually understand the radionesis reaction between the electron beam and water molecules really well. So it turns out the major dominating effect is actually an ionic strength effect. So when you have electron beam uh, shining onto the sample, that's effectively increasing the salt concentration of the system. So as Xinchen mentioned, one way we know this is because we can do uh, in-situ liquid DM imaging together with small angle X-ray scattering experiments on the same system. We can get a one-to-one -one correlation if we just fine tune the salt concentration in the SACS measurement. And also we can retrieve the same structure using simulation by just modulating the ion strength. So I can imagine completely a similar approach can actually also be adopted for this organic solvent mediating nanoparticle self-assembly. So we do think we are going to converge as a real realistic yeah. picture, not really just related or limited to the liquid phase TEM. Yeah. But then this is also related to my question for Xin Chen. So, so in this case, you mentioned the electron beam can charge the particle. Yeah. So what type of charge are you thinking about? Positive charge or negative charge? Or, mm -hmm. We think it's positive. So we have done experiment, but I, I, unfortunately I didn't include here where we use negative charge. We make the we make polymer that carry negative charge blocks and they adhere to the membrane very, very strongly. And yeah. Uh -huh. Right, if it's uh, if that actually makes sense, then in this case one way for you to play with the substrate particle interaction would be to change somehow the ionic strength. You can you have organic solvent, but you can still add some uh, surfactant molecules as a way to change the ionic strength. Exactly, mm -hmm. but the radiolysis or radiation chemistry of this system, this type of non aqueous solvent, are much less understood compared to aqueous phase. So I think there's a lot, you know, fundamental research mm -hmm. that needs to be done in that area yeah. in order to. But what I can say is the image I show, the movie I show. Are actually quite reproducible. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that gives me some hope that this is what we are showing here is real. The control is very, very well. As you change the solvent, you actually see drastically different assembly behavior from, from different solvent. Yeah. I'm sorry, can I follow up? Because uh, I just have something relevant, so it's easy, it would be. Uh, Ole Gang, Colombian, Brookhaven. So I couldn't resist this lovely discussion. Uh, I'm following up on some of the questions which have been just discussed, the chat uh, mentioned and Jin mentioned. So there is one discussion uh, related to the technique, uh, charging effects, all this was discussed. My other question, to what degree is the knowledge obtained by electron microscopy methods, which is intrinsically has a surface as a kind of like a gross mode, yeah. different from three-dimensional, because one can imagine in a simple scenario it will be just you promoting particular direction, direction of the crystal, but in the more complicated scenarios you might be inducing different. So I, this yeah. is more like a general uh, question you can address, and this is maybe relevant to some of your comments. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a very confined environment in the end. So there are growth modes that you can observe and analyze here, but if you say you use this platform to repeat exactly what you expect from a box solution, I think we are not there yet because of geometry of the cell. Okay, so luckily the really big questions have already been addressed, which I also wanted to ask, but then I have a very technical one. So on charging, so, and we, we get the same question very often and, and invented basically a, a reply. So I wonder what yours is. So either it's charged, either it charges both the surface and the particle, then they would repel each other, right? Yes. And the, or they would charge each other 
differently. Well, then they attract each other, but then you create repulsion between the particles. They should be relatively strong if your uh, solvents are very unpolar. So do you think that's what's actually happening or is something completely different happening with the so charge? We think both the particle and membrane, silicon connection membrane, become positive charge under this TEM illumination condition. And you still have enough attraction to keep the nuclei or to get the nucleating on the surface. Well, that's why the dose rate becomes very important. You have to con precisely control the dose rate so that the particle don't move away from the imaging area. What I show in the very high dose rate case, they are quickly repelled by the silicon nitrate membrane. That's how we interpret it. And then you see okay. they leave from the imaging area. So you want a little bit of charge, which you cannot avoid, but not too much. That's what you're saying? Exactly. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, we can take a break. And since we're over time, there's, there's uh, we can follow up uh, uh, during the coffee break. Oh. Is there one more question?